Today on The Laws of Light, it's time to combine three objects together and light and separate them all at the same time. We're sponsored today by The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an incredible library of videos and tutorials taught by some of the greatest people, professors and photographers of the world. They've got a library of over 7,000 topics, everything from math to chess to cooking to photography. One of my favorite was the National Geographic Master Series. Those geographic photographers show you how to go on location, how to shoot in mixed light situations, fabulous tutorials. Viewers from the Slant of Lens are going to be treated to a one month free trial if you go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash the Slant of Lens or click on the link below. Take advantage of that great offer, start your free trial today, but now we need to get to the Laws of Light. Hi, this is JP Morgan and welcome to our fourth in the Laws of Light series, photographing a ball, cube, and a cylinder. We're going to add three of them together to help us understand how to do all those objects at one time. There isn't anything you can photograph that doesn't have one, two, or three of these subject matters in every single photograph. So let's take a quick look at all the things we've learned about camera angle, about quality of light, about dimension, about separation using three objects. First off, when we place these objects on the table, what did we do? Well, we've got a highlight side and we've got a shadow side. So I place the square so that the highlight side of the square gives me relief on the shadow side of my sphere. I place my cylinder so that the shadow side of the cube will give relief to the highlight side and separation to the cylinder. And then on the camera right side, we add a light on the background that gives a separation for the shadow side of our cylinder. So each of these are giving separation dimension to the one next to it. Our light coming in from camera left gives us wonderful drawing for each of the subject matters. The only thing I might do to make this just a little bit better is I would lower this light just a tiny bit. And what happens when I do that? Two things happen. The highlight on top of the cube got a little darker. The shadow did crawl up on the side of the cube just a little bit. But it's okay to have cast shadows. They create dimension. If that really bothers me, I can take my sphere and move it a little bit forward. I can take my cube and move it just a little bit back. And I now still have that same dimension going on from highlight to shadow, from highlight to shadow, from highlight to shadow. And I can get rid of that cast shadow. But sometimes a cast shadow allows me to think, oh, they're in relationship to each other. I'm okay moving my cube in and I have a little bit of that shadow because I like the cast shadows. I think it gives us nice dimension with one another. When we have these three together and we have the highlight to shadow, highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow, we now can take little bits of tin foil, little pieces of white silver card, and we can put them in these areas here where it's dead to camera, you can't see them, and that those cards will reflect light back into the side of our sphere. They'll reflect some interesting light back into the side of our cube. You can put some small fill lights, and they don't have to be a big source. They can be small sources. They can be little pieces of silver, and they create some interesting highlights back in there. So you can start to fill inside the, the uh, image. That's an important principle to understand when you're doing product photography. This is a broad source fill to open up everything on set. But when you're doing product photography, you're going to want to use small mirrors, and small little pieces of reflected material to come in and to start opening up different areas. And it makes it more interesting and not just broadly overlit and filled. So it becomes an interesting way to fill some of the shadows. Now again, we're looking at this with a very directional point source light. The same thing is going to happen for us when we go to a softer diffused light. In this diffused light, the transition is a lot softer, a lot smoother. We see the highlight transition in the shadow, our highlight back here is not as bright. Our shadows that are casting onto our cube are not as harsh. We see everything is just a little softer, but still a beautiful kind of separation and a nice dimension in our subject matter. It's a very pretty light. I'd probably bring the exposure up just a little bit on this to make it look right, and maybe the background down just a tiny bit, but it's going to give us that right dimension and that separation. Now, it's interesting. If we take this light and we go into a top, back, or an overhead light, Interesting things are trying to happen here. We have light now coming from top to bottom. So our highlight into shadow. Highlight, this brighter, darker, darkest, darker, nice highlight on the side into a shadow side here. We've lost most of our cast shadow. There's a little bit, but not very much. So we get rid of a lot of those cast shadows when we go overhead. It's a pretty light, a different direction of light, but allows these things to maybe be a little closer to one another. and to be able to maybe live in a little, little bit closer context to each other. It's just a different way of looking at the light. 
So if I take this light around from behind, if I drop it directly behind, it's going to create some really interesting things that are going to happen. We're going to get wonderful shadows that fall forward. We're going to get nice highlights on the top. It's not going to help our cylinder out as much as if we just bring this a little bit to the side. And now our cylinder is going to start to have some wrapping from right to left. Our sphere wraps from top to bottom. Our cube wraps side to side. It gives us a little bit of dimension there. So placing this light will really depend on the height and the size of each of these subjects on whether we want to be right or left. And in doing that, it will help each of them to have the best light that kind of represents them and what we need to do to show their qualities. Let's look at some images that capture combining a ball, a cube, and a cylinder. So there you have a look at a ball, a cube, and a cylinder. How to light them together, how to separate them from one another, how to separate them from the background. They become a great example of the objects and things you will face in life when you photograph and when you light, when you do video. This is very much a building process. It's helping you to see that there are different objects in every image and how to get each of their surfaces to look correct. So next, we're gonna take the principles that you've just learned and start applying them to real objects, people, and places. So keep those cameras rolling, keep on clicking. We've got a great download we're offering here at the Simon Lens called Stop Motion Basics for Beginners. Trisha Zemp takes all the information she's learned on how to do stop motion, from how to shoot the stop motion, to how to edit it and post it and put music to it on Instagram or YouTube. It's a fabulous journey where she'll teach you everything you need to know to be able to do stop motion. If you're interested in stop motion, this is gonna teach you the process and what you need to do. So go to thesunlens.com slash stop motion, get your copy today. You should subscribe to the Slanted Lens. It may not save your life, but why risk it? Just push that button right there.